did such a substantial and satisfying novel covering three generations, three continents, and a huge cast of characters originally germinate in your mind? Wow. Hmm. I think the original concept came from uh, talking to my mother and her uh, the stories she used to tell about, uh, about growing up in India at a particular point in time. So the germ of the, the novel came from my mother's generation and her father's generation, so this concept of the distillery and where it was situated, that was all from her particular life. And so I, I think I drew from that, and drew from some of the writings she, uh, she, she, she made as part of her memoirs before she died, and, uh, and, and, and built on those, built in terms of fabrication and fiction on top of that. But I wanted to move it from a particular point in time, from what would be my grandfather's time, or the turn of the, the the 19th, 19th into the 20th century uh, in colonial India to um, through independence partition and then the, the notion of a post-colonial diasporic reality. So that's that's why I tried to have that fairly wide swath of uh, of uh, what would it be about well over 100 100 and 100 years or so. Yeah. Mm, and three continents. And as three well. continents. And that, that was part of the the idea of the movement. A lot of the work I've done has gone. Uh, between places and geographies and, and political climates and, and, and sometimes very fabricated environments, uh, sometimes very real ones, depending on the, on the context. So here I was taking this particular family story from central parts of India, or different parts of India, actually, from the west coast to central, to, uh, to, uh, to, to the UK, to northern England, and then over to the east coast of Canada, and then, then to central Canada. So trying to move move through it, which follows a kind of political and colonial um, track. And there are also parallels between the Cargat family story and your personal family history? There are. I mean, it's very interesting because the very first book I published was a poetic novella, and it was uh, it was completely a story that had nothing really to do with me. It was a, it related in some ways to to, um, uh, to to certain histories, but it wasn't about me at all, and I had no connection to it. But the assumption, for some reason, and I think it was the, the idea of the first publication, was that this must be all about you. And so that the line on the back of the, that that the book, Leverage, was uh, stated that I, I was born in Bhopal. And so people would constantly come up to me thinking this had something to do with the Union Carbide disaster. They think it had something to do with my my own story, and of course, it had nothing to do with it. And I thought it was quite funny. And then progressively each novel has was changed in, in scope, looked at different elements, um, some personal but mostly mythological and, and that. And then this novel did actually draw on on, uh, on a lot of family histories. And uh, I think that the normal trajectory, what you're supposed to do is that if, when you have your first novel, you're supposed to have something around family and draw from there and move, move gradually distant. I think we're getting closer in. So. So maybe I should write my memoirs next, except yeah, even absolutely. I wouldn't be interested in reading them. So. <laughs> um, we're going to provide some links from our website to images from the collaborative art shows that were done in Vancouver and Ottawa for a little distillery. Um, and that will show readers how the book influenced visual art. But what I'm curious about is how your being a visual artist may have influenced your writing. Well, uh, I'm, I'm excited by the idea of taking the... The idea of, of of the textual and moving it into another space, and that was that was really the the, the the genesis of this. Not so much about thinking visually and then moving that into the text space, but some, somehow the other way around. Mm -hmm. And so people have asked me because we took this into an installation, um, into an exhibit of a kind. How uh, how how did it change? How did it change the writing? And I don't think it actually did because they, they were kind of like parallel streams. There, I was I was working with them quite differently. The, the visual was very much a collaborative process. I was working with, uh, with Brendan Tang, uh, Diana Chiari, David Bateman, and countless numbers of, of technicians and curators. And also, it was really a lot of fun doing that. Like how, how will this work? Something as simple as how do we hang this piece? And the technicians at Center A took a, about two days to figure out, to figure out and implement the hanging of these, these text pieces. Right? So um, what I found was interesting was, was, again, these two parallel streams, but then what happens when the, the person who might read the book instead just inhabits the space? Now, the space itself was exciting because I had, uh, when I was working with some research assistants, I said the one thing I insisted on was having the, the entire text from the novel made available. 
in some capacity. Now, I'd originally thought of doing it as, as video, as one element would be video, so running along the bottom of, uh, of a very long uh, 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 rough footage of that, that I ended up shooting in India would just be the entire text of the novel. And I, I realized that was going to take, that would take you know, hours and hours and hours of, of footage, so I ended up not doing that, and I scrolled it instead. So I had, I had scrolling text, not from the entire novel, but from large sections of it. But what I did do is I printed out the entire novel, or a draft, before, before you got your hands on it. And, uh, and it, was, it was an early draft. And I just printed out the entire thing on these huge scripts that were, uh, or scripts, I suppose, that were about four feet by seven feet, and the very large 24-point text, and just read it, run right across. So these things were hanging in the gallery space, 15 of these. And people could walk between them. So you had this wonderful moment where you have... Uh, I might be looking at somebody, and then they disappear, not disappear, but they appear behind um, one of these, these screens. So I could read this text, I could read them through the text as they're reading the text through the other text. You know, there's multiple layers. And it was interesting when we tried to, to photograph it with like cheap digital cameras and all, um, it would immediately focus to the, ne the nearest text. So if you wanted to focus on, say, Brendan's sculpture that was in the back corner, it wouldn't focus on that, it would be out of focus. So very interesting, interesting play. But any, uh, getting back to your question, though, of how does the, does the visual influence the textual, I think it's, it's this beautiful interplay. And my interest was to make available, uh, create a space that made available the novel or the concepts of the novel, both in book form and in, uh, in three-dimensional and in two-dimensional forms, a physical space. People could. I keep using the word inhabit. Mm. I wanted people to inhabit it, just like they might when they read something. I wanted them to physically feel inside a space and come away thinking, "I know something now about some lives, fictional or otherwise, that were that are outside of myself." And that's one of the strengths of the novel. It is it is a very visual novel to read. You have a very strong sense of where you are in each of the scenes, so that comes across really well. In the third part of the book, there's a lot of music. Are you a musician? Not at all. And, uh, but I was interested in music as a concept, so that's where mm -hmm. music get, uh, got played in. And, and that's where, uh, of course, Freddie. Freddie. Well, that's what I was going to ask about. There's a lot of references to Freddie Mercury songs. There he is. Um, so what's with that? Why, why Queen? Okay, Freddie, Freddie was born Farouk. Uh, uh, Farouk was, um, uh, was born in Zanzibar, and then he came to, to India with his parents. And he was, uh, or sorry, to England with his parents. And he was, uh, he was a Parsi, so he was born Parsi, but he was very, very musically inclined. Of course, he had an incredible uh, voice range. And uh, he, of course, is the lead singer, was the lead singer of Queen. Now, a lot of people, when they were, I know when I was growing up, and he was, this is around high school, and, you know, Queen was really popular, and listening to this, no one knew that he was, not only that he was Parsi, that he was any, anything other than um, a white, British, you know, part of the pop scene, right? And, and, and I found out much later that he was from the Parsi community, and, or not so much the community, but from that family. And, and yet the stuff was kept kind of hidden. And there was other stuff hidden about him too, because he was a he was, um, uh, very flamboyant character. Uh, he was, uh, he was a, a, a gay icon before, um, before he actually came out. You know, people would see him as a gay icon, but he wouldn't identify his sexuality. And indeed, he didn't talk about his sexuality at all until uh, the day before he died, he released a press release, he died of AIDS. And he talked about dying of AIDS, and, and he talked about the, the importance of addressing the, the question. Of course, the question not just being the, the epidemic, but the, the reason it was kept closeted for so long around queer sexuality, all these different elements. So that it, I found in Freddie both an incredible musical talent uh, and the, a lyrical sensibility. If you listen to some of those lyrics, they're multiply layered. And... And still, uh, there were all these, these levels of subterfuge, things that were being hidden. So when, when someone like Freddie is singing I, you know, I, about just wanting someone to love, right? You, you, I question then, where was that energy coming from? What was he talking about? Who was he talking to? And so in the novel, I borrow quite shamelessly from uh, the lyrics of Queen. And uh, because I think they have a lot to say about these levels of diaspora, Things that are covered and then uncovered, things that are are seen and unseen. So <laughs>